thank you, Amrita, and thank you, Khaki Labs, uh, for the generous introduction. Uh, a very warm welcome to one and all old friends and new, and uh, a very warm welcome to stories from Goan houses. The, uh, shall we start uh, sharing the screen now? I just before at the outset want to thank my team. Without the team, this book would have never come about. And I would have never been able to achieve what I have been able to achieve over the 27 years that I've lived here in Goa. I am also a Mumbai, uh, Mumbai girl, like some of you, but I've made Goa my home now. And it's a little spot for me. I, and I feel com very, very comfortable here. And uh, Goa has been good to uh, to me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Uh, in this picture, in the introduction to the presentation, I'm sitting in my balcony, which is like an inside-outside space in my own home in the village of Saligaon. Uh, and uh, it's also a sort of social screening device, if I may tell you. That if you can see a part of, in the picture, a part of the street, uh, to my right, uh, it's a, it's a, the Balkan is a device that helps you interact with people who are passing by, if you want to, of course. And if a stranger visits, then in the old days, now you don't do it. But in the old days, you would welcome a stranger and make him sit in the Balkan in this inside outside space when question him about his ancestry, about his antecedents, where he's come from who his grandmother is, who his mother-in-law is, and so on. And if they were socially accepted, then the person or the visitor would be taken in. So it's a very important spot that I'm sitting in. Now, the start of this book is actually happened 23 years ago when Gerard de Cunha uh, got in touch with me and asked me to write a book on the houses of Goa. Initially, it was just like going to be a sort of an encyclopedia or a catalog of 100 windows, 200 doors, and so on. And I thought it was very boring to do that kind of thing. So because without people, a house is really an empty shell. So I suggested that we do a book on houses of Goa we do the architecture, of course, most of the book is architecture, but we also put in personality profiles of about six houses uh, that where the house owners give us their stories. And that I think 23 years ago was the germ of what happened last year on the 13th of November on my mom's centenary when we released stories from Goan houses. Now, I would, uh, people think that's all I do, sit in Goa and write books, besides, of course, going to the beach and playing the guitar and drinking beer, none of which I do. The, uh, what I, the books happen because I was part, I am part of a movement. In Mumbai also, I was part of Bombay Environmental Action Group. Sham Chainani was my mentor, Cyrus Gazdar, uh, Firoza Godrej. S.P. Godred Sorabji, these are people who helped me cut my teeth on the environmental front. And because of that, and the support of the bureaucrats in Bombay, I was able to come when I came to Goa to put in the same kind of effort, or even more perhaps, because it was needed more in Goa. I set up and founded Goa Heritage Action Group along with my uh, uh, colleague Raya Shankwalkar and uh, Poonam Verma Mashkarinius. And writing books and writing articles, giving talks and lectures became part of the whole movement. So it's not like the books took center stage. We also, as part of the movement of spreading awareness, uh, had festivals because Goa is very, very uh, rich in the whole culture of having festivals, not just religious festivals, but literature festivals and cultural festivals. Even in the smallest village, you will find the tradition of festivals. So I took cue from that. And we had uh, five, over six years, five festivals and the Fontaineers 
uh, heritage precinct. It was a unique festival where we opened up people's houses and we used these houses as art galleries. So there was interface between visitors, artists who were displaying their work, exhibiting their talent and house owners. And some people who came to these festivals had for the first time entered an informal art gallery like this. We started at the Kampal neighborhood, also a heritage precinct. We had a Kampal festival where we mixed up uh, uh, cultural events. We had lit fest, we had lectures, we had art, and we had the local participation, which was very, very important to us. The other thing important to us was in, when we entered a heritage neighborhood, we made sure that it looked better when we left. We also had folk utsavs. And from that time, when we first started out, when people were so reluctant to even enter a heritage precinct, and people, were, people would approach me saying, what is this heritage you're talking about? What does it mean? From that time, I think we've come a long way. Last year in November, towards the end of last year, between 15th and 19th of November, we had a hugely successful Goa Heritage Festival where time took, came full circle. We had it in the Kampal uh, Heritage Precinct, just like we had done 22 years ago. Now, before the books, before the awareness, before the festivals, the articles and the talks and lectures, what was the scene like in, uh, in Goa? There were buildings that were derelict. There were buildings, houses that were abandoned. And I'm often asked this question, and I'm sure you are also asking the question in your mind, in your heart. How did people allow their houses and their buildings to get to this state, this state of dereliction? There are a number of reasons. One is that there are legal disputes sometimes, there's ownership dispute. Second reason often is penury. Nobody wants to spend on the, on the house. And the third most important reason is, to my mind, is people have left Goa, they've left abandoning their homes, they have made life elsewhere in other parts of India and abroad, and they have no no stake, no investment, no emotional investment in Goa. Hopefully and happily that is changing today. Now, after Houses of Goa, slowly other books came around. I tried my hand at translating from Marathi to English and four of those stories appeared in Ferry Crossing, edited by Manohar Shetty who is also a Homi Baba Fellow like me. And he recommended my name to the Homi Baba Fellowship Council. I'm grateful to them for giving me a grant to study the contribution of the master builders of Goa. That became a book called Hidden Hands, Master Builders of Goa. Then I was commissioned by Bal Munkur and Sharda Dvivedi and Rahul Merotra of Eminence Design to do a book on walking in Goa. So 10 of my favorite walks are there. Mar commissioned a walking tour guide in old Goa, which I enjoyed greatly. And that on the cover, by the way, is uniquely Goan art called Kavi, K-A-A-V-I, which we are now exercised in uh, trying to restore. Then, an, then as I was studying the houses, I realized that the church architecture had influenced the houses. So then came Walking with Angels, where I've done a comparative study of the architecture of the churches and how that has influenced the Catholic houses. And again, in turn, how that has influenced the large eminent Hindu houses. I was also writing fiction on the side for the local newspapers, Navin Times and Goa Today. And from there, uh, I made an anthology called Dust and Other Short Stories. You will recognize the artist on the cover. That's Mario Miranda. I just walked up to him and I said, I've done this collection of stories. Will you do the cover? And he said, yes. 
Then there's uh, somebody suggested that there's uh, to do an autobiography that I've lived long enough, I think. And before I lose my memory, I should put everything down. So I did a book on uh, my journey, my personal journey, uh, the Africa and uh, England, Africa and back to Bombay and the life in Bombay and then here in Goa. And one of my friends and I used to go on and on about talking about houses. And one of my friends said to me, you know, there's more to life than a house in Goa. And I said, thank you. You've given me my title. So that is my autobiography. There's more to life than a house in Goa. And as it so happened, I came across um, the OVOs through my study of Kavi art in a temple. And it's a long story, but to tell you very briefly, that's how I found OVOs or songs that are sung the grinding stone. I translated them. They're a mix of Marathi and Konkani. And the first volume came out in 2018. It was released at the Goa Art and Literature Festival. Subsequently, I found that it's not only the Hindus who sing the OVOs, but also the Catholics. So we included the Catholic Gauda OVOs and the second volume came out. That is my friend, and fellow translator and documenter, uh, folklorist Sarojini Bhiva Gaonkar on the cover in the green study. Then came stories from Goan houses. Now, 22 years and a full circle. And I, I can't begin to tell you what a journey it's been. And I want to take you on this journey with me on the 21 selected houses in this book. Who suggested it? One of the house owners, Upendra Gaonekar. His house is in Ponda, very, very remote area. It's not on, on the main beat or not on any highway or anything. His suggestion came as the germ seed for a new book. He said, Eta, you write about everything you're writing about our houses. What happens when our children go abroad? They lose their connections with Goa. They don't know what to be proud of when they come back. They only come once a year for Ganesh. And that also, if they can't, they don't. So it touched a chord and I said, let me do a houses, starting with Upendra's house, Upendra Gaonekar and his family house in Ponda. Now this is his living room, filled, back to the brim with beautiful, absolutely exquisite French furniture. How did a Goan house get French furniture? As it so happened, in the governor's palace in Goa, they had a French room. Because of political reasons, they wanted to get rid of all the French furniture and, and rename the room. They didn't want to call it French room anymore. So they put the furniture out to auction and Upendra's family went and got the whole collection and the whole collection with chandeliers and sconces and everything came to this living room. This It's called a sala, S-A-L-A. -A. And the house is like, a, it's two houses in one. The front is very European and the back is very Indian. Now you see to, the, to, to my right, that is Alka Gaonekar, one of the daughters-in-law of the house. In fact, she is the last daughter-in-law to ever cook on a wood-fired stove. But this is a cow dung floor. And this is the kind of juxtaposition that a lot of these very ostentatious looking eminent houses have. The front is very European in design then, and the back is very Indian in design. Now, through uh, Upendra, Upendra's wife, Sangeeta, is actually comes from this house, Mamai Kamath house in Panji. If you've been to Panji, you see to my left, you'll see a little bit of the Adil Shah Palace, which used to be the secretariat, now emptied. This house, Mamai Kamath house, was a bead factory. And what is a bead factory doing in the middle of the city? As it so happened, the Adil Shah had a harem at the back, which you can't see in this picture. 
and the harem, there was a high demand, lot of demand for beads. They had bead ornaments, they had bead screens and so on. So this little house was a bead factory. Later, I think the demand for beads must have gone down. And Mamai Kamals, who migrated from South Goa from a village called Girdoli, came and occupied this house, the bead factory, and became very, very important to the Portuguese government. That they fell from favor is another story. But at, at one point of time, they were importing everything, literally from a pin to an elephant for the Portuguese government and for the Portuguese officials who lived in Panji. This is Sangeeta on my left. And Sangeeta Gaunikar comes from that Mamai Kamath house. They maintain their tradition. This is such a large house. There are three inner Raj Angons or big courtyards. Regal, very regal. Now, this puja takes place every 5.30, every evening. And people, even if they moved out of the house and living in flats in the rest in the, in the city, they will make it a point to come there and attend the evening prayer service. They also have a family temple. And uh, this tank that you see on the right is from that family temple, which is at quite a distance from Panji. And these two ladies, complete strangers, were requested by our photographer, Daniel D'Souza and Hari, uh, to come and sit there because Daniel is one photographer who doesn't like an empty space. He loves to fill it with somebody or some person or the human element. And these two ladies, complete strangers, came, sat there, and not just posed for a photo, but they also sang for the photographer. That's Goa for you. There's a connection between each and every one of the houses in the book. Uh, we've come to Mamai Kamath uh, house in Panji through the Gaunikar house in Ponda. As it so happened that the Dempo family, which is one of our uh, most eminent families in Goa, mining family, they had migrated to Karnataka when there was a pressure to convert to Christianity. When they came back, they had no place to stay. And while this house was being built, they stayed at the Mamai Kamath house. So you see the connection. So we've jumped from Gaunikar house to Mamai Kamath house to Kaza Dempo. Kaza is, means house in Portuguese. And this is where it all began. They still have, they honor their humble beginnings. Next please. They honor their humble beginnings. They, this is the townhouse of the Dempos called Dempo Nebars. What is interesting is that there are, this is like a European sala on the first floor, very Indian at the back. And this house belonged to the Jesuits. There was a nunnery here. And what is most interesting to us is that there is Greek cross, if you notice, on the uh, fence, on the, fe on the wall compound wall, which they did not change even after they bought it. And another feature which is most interesting to us is this little temple. Now I'm going to put a question to you. Does this temple remind you of a, a chapel? Yes. It does, because it was a chapel. They, they refurbished it. And the, one of the features to, that reminds us that this was a chapel is that the Sabha Mandapam normally in a Hindu temple is much larger than the inner sanctum sanctorum. Well, here it's the other way around. The Dempo family is one family that honors uh, tradition, honors ancestors everywhere, right through their offices and their homes. However grand they are, they will always have portraits of their ancestors. And because they were importers and exporters of coconut, timber, and such uh, products, 
they did they used DAOs. Now this may not be the first DAO that started the business, but to honor that trade, the DAO, they have uh, commissioned an artist to paint, uh, uh, do a watercolor of the of a DAO. So this is something that I find very touching and uh, very moving actually, that they uh, they never forget their ancestry. While, uh, while doing the book, one of the things we noticed is that, you know, we, we were a team. So we were never more, never less than three people at one time. And yet we were made to feel so much part of all the celebrations, anything that was going on. Here's a birthday party for a little girl. And the children also did just, we were like flies on the wall, actually. Nobody bothered. Uh, about us, nobody was self-conscious, nothing. They were just so natural. And this is what makes the book so special to us. Here's uh, the family of Souza Montero in a village called Sioli. And uh, that's where Remo Fernandez comes from. So most people know Sioli. And that's Chiral and his brother and his family. And every evening, the whole family gets together and plays music. So they played us and uh, we have a, we have them on video as well. They played for us out of so much joy. And the thing is that Suzette, Chiral's wife, sometimes goes down to water the garden and they all come to the window on the first floor and play music for her while she's watering the garden. Now these kind of stories you will not get if you just come as a visitor and go back. This is what makes Goa special. Now, as it so happened that um, there is a story, one of the houses in the book is uh, the Dada Vaidya house. And there is a legend, he was a legend in Ayurveda. He was very well known. Now, there is a story which I have to tell you that Ayurveda as a practice was banned by the governor in Goa at some point of time, the viceroy, sorry. The Viceroy and Ayurveda saying it's all rubbish, it's mumbo jumbo, it's uh, magic and uh, black magic and it should not be allowed where he was a uh, Viceroy. So they all went underground, all the Ayurveda doctors. But Dada Vaidya continued his practice and uh, uh, one, uh, one day, as it so happened, the Viceroy's son fell ill and his wife Viceroy's wife insisted on calling Dada Vaidya. And he said, no, I will not, uh, you know, give up my, my principles and so on. So he said, finally he relented by saying, okay, I'll test him first. And he sent the urine sample uh, as asked for by Dada Vaidya to Dada Vaidya. And Dada Vaidya had a look at the sample. He examined it, the urine sample, and he said, this patient needs a very healthy dose of horse gram. So you, I think you got it that the, he had sent the horse urine as a to test the other way there, and that convinced the viceroy. He sent his son with his mother, with the mother, and the other way there cured him. Fortunately, the other way there statue was made in Portugal and brought from Portugal to Goa and put up in the middle of the street uh, in Kepe. And he's the only Indian leader or Indian uh, personality to have his statue placed by the Portuguese government. Speaking of medicine, I think we cannot escape but talk about Peni in Goa. Right from uh, being infancy, the, uh, in Goa, they use Peni as a very important medicinal uh, drink and uh, give it to babies when they're teething, give it to babies, rub, uh, use it as an alcohol rub or on tummies when babies have colic and so on. And the most important person in the penny industry is this gentleman, Bebe Costa and his family. Now he had, what is unusual about this plantation is that he's a first generation planter of Kaju. 
His father was a banker. They grew up in the city of Margao. He had absolutely no clue about plantations. And yet he has one of the most successful penny plantations, organic penny plantations in Goa. This is his home. It's a beautiful house, very well maintained, lovely family, two daughters. And the most intriguing person from, uh, from our point of view, most intriguing uh, painting or caricature that we have seen so far in the Goan houses is uh, this uh, funny little drawing uh, on one panel in the front of the house. Now here, what looks like a Portuguese soldier or official holding up a cobra, there's a hen, there are two eggs, and somebody is obviously picking up the eggs or stealing the eggs, and that man or half dog uh, is, is a most intriguing kind of caricature. Now I asked Bebe if he knew what it was, he said no. But the neighbors think, and his own wife, Shalini, also think that it was either a warning to people not to steal things, you'd be turned into a dog, or it's to ward off the evil eye. Now, it's not something that we are supposed to believe in if, it, uh, if we are converted to Catholicism, but everybody in Goa, irrespective of what caste, creed, uh, religion they follow, they all believe in the evil eye, let me tell you. So going from caricatures and art, I've come to this art in Goan homes. This absolutely stunning picture has been done on the walls of a Pai Riker house in uh, Savoy Vere, the village. And this also has an interesting connection because 22 years ago, one of my fellow artists and writers, Subodh Kerkar, and also my neighbor in Saligaon, he had given me a very slim volume uh, with these sort of paintings printed in them done by the Department of Art and Culture. And the funny thing was that not a single picture had a caption, no caption, no reference to where it came from, what, it just simply called Art and Goan Homes, no reference whatsoever. 22 years later, I go to this house introduced by my colleague, Alinto Coelho, and I see I'm just stunned. The very paintings that had evaded us for 22 years are right there on the wall. Now we find that these paintings were actually done as references because it was a very artsy uh, family and very theater, uh, theater oriented family. They used to do what they called nataks in Marathi. And for nataks, it, the, they never used women as actors in those days. It was always the men impersonating women characters on the stage. So how would the ma male uh, members of the family know uh, how to dress? How did Draupadi dress? Or how, what sort of sari did Shakuntala wear? So these drawings on the walls were meant to be references. The family is also very, very educated and Mangirish Pai Raikar. And you'll notice that the, the name Rama, Ramanatha Krishna is spelled the Portuguese way. They couldn't say, they, there was no K in the Portuguese language. So Krishna is not spelled K-R-I-S-H-A, but C-R-I-S-N-A, Krishna. So he's, uh, he's maintained that spelling even today. And this is the old ancestral house that we see in this picture where actually the family began. Then they moved to the larger house where the paintings on the walls are. This is used as a storeroom right now by the School of Agriculture. One thing Im important about the School of Agriculture is that gir uh, girls and boys are given equal importance in the school the uh, the teacher here is teaching uh, is they have a field they take them to the field there's field work and the girls are also taught how to climb coconut trees and uh, uh, cut branches 
and trim the trees and everything that normally boys do. Now, when we had gone to the Pai Riker house, Sudin Pai Riker brought out a broom to clean the wall before we could take pictures. And we were intrigued as to where these brooms come from. So that led us to Vishnu Harwalkar, who actually makes brooms from the palm frond beautifully. And his wife, in fact, is a performer. She's a folk artist. And she also sings the OBOs, songs that are sung at the grinding stone. So we've got their house in the book as well. This is him shaving off the palm frond to make uh, the, the brooms. And to my right is a picture of, if you see two pieces of what look like translucent stones and a little bit of uh, wool, that those stones are literally flint stones. And he uses them to light the wool and light his beadies. So they also make beadies at home. So we learn two crafts, in fact, how to make beadies and how to make brooms. Now, how can we talk about Goa at this time of the year, January 2023, without talking about Christmas and how it's celebrated in a Goan house? This is the Rodriguez Irabello house. And if you're intrigued by the double barrel surname, uh, let me tell you, there'll be a lot of these surnames that you'll come across in Goa. And that happens because if there's a only daughter in the house and she marries someone, and that daughter is the lady in black right now, and uh, uncle and auntie propose, uncle proposed to her in this very balkan. So if there's a only daughter, only child, then the husband is... Uh, offers to come and live with the wife, with the bride. Now they are welcomed. They are called Ghar Zawai or Ghar Jamai. And they are welcomed into these homes on the condition that the children will take a double barrel surname. The surname of both sides, both sides of the family, the girl's side and the boy's side. That's how you get these double barrel surnames. The E is and in Portuguese. Here they are celebrating Christmas, and I have to tell you this story that this uh, chicken, uh, uh, ch very famous chicken dish called chicken shakuti, kaprial, sorry, kaprial, is uh, named uh, after the kafirs or the Arab uh, traders, uh, slavers who had come to Goa. And chicken kaprial was actually, is now uh, put out on tables as a dish that looks green in color, but there was one point uh, of time when it came, uh, it was red. But when it was, when they saw it was red, the Europeans assumed that it would be a very spicy dish and wouldn't touch it. So they changed it to a green masala and it became a green kafriya. Collectibles and personal collections are one thing that you see in almost every Goan home. They love their born hoarders. And this is the attic room of the Rodriguez Ribello house. And these are very, very important to all social scientists, anyone who's studying not just houses, but the history of families in Goa, the exposition, religious history, social history, cultural history, and personal family histories as well. This is the team that put the book together. Uh, that's me in the blue sari. There's Daniel D'Souza in the red t-shirt. He's our photographer. Nisha is the designer. Alinto was responsible for putting me in touch with so many homes, some of which I knew, some I didn't know. Uh, so we're really very grateful. Aaron, who put the videos together. Hari in the middle with, in the white shirt. He's the one who's my consultant. 